Paul. I'm a plastic and reconstructive surgeon now in uh, practicing in Melbourne, uh, mainly now in the field of skin cancer oncology uh, and especially melanoma, do a lot of melanoma. Um, I was aware of Doctors' Orchestra all over the world, especially in Europe and Germany. Um, and there was a, a, a chamber music summer school in Mount Buller, which was held in January. And I, after the first one of those in 92, there were a disproportionate number of doctors playing string quartets and chamber music. And I thought this would be a very good way to start an Australian Doctors' Orchestra because we didn't have one. Um, and everybody I asked uh, was very enthusiastic to do it. And then it just sort of grew. And um, uh, you know, everybody knew someone else who could play and so on. Uh, there's also nurses and physios and dentists who play with us. Um, and uh, it just grew from that. Uh, the very first one, which of course is very sweet in my memory, uh, was at the Melbourne Hall in Melbourne. There were 76 in the orchestra um, and it was a small stage that was just as well because Melbourne Hall is the Melbourne, University of Melbourne Conservatorium and it was the lovely Chris Martin who worked there as a lecturer in uh, viola and conducting and he sort of, um, he really was hugely instrumental in setting it all up with me and uh, he was our conductor for 12 years, sadly he passed away a few years ago. And we've had other, lots of other conductors since then. Uh, the idea was to play for a medically related charity so the proceeds from the concert could be passed on to the charity. And the very first one was Multiple Sclerosis Society. Uh, we've played for the Sydney Melanoma Unit, uh, then called Sydney Melanoma Unit, now called the Melanoma Foundation Australia. Um, we've played for uh, the uh, Malcolm Sargent Cancer Fund for Children. Uh, we've played for the Glaucoma Foundation. Um, recently, Mental Health and Huntington's uh, Research in Sydney. I'm Robin Cap, and I'm the Executive Officer of Huntington's New South Wales and ACT. The ADO got involved with us um, just over 12 months ago. They were keen to uh, make us the beneficiary of their wonderful concert that was held in November last year. We were able to raise much needed funds for our youth program. This program only started last year and we employ a youth worker to work with young people from Huntington's families as these, fa these young ones have special needs regarding living with a mother or father with Huntington's disease. Therefore, the proceeds from this concert will ensure that our youth program continues in the foreseeable future to help children and young people to understand Huntington's better, to help them to learn new ways to cope, and to help parents to talk to their children about the disease. On behalf of the board and members of Huntington's New South Wales, I would like to thank ADO for choosing our organisation as its charity for their 25th anniversary concert. It's been a privilege and a pleasure to be with you over these past three days and congratulations on your silver anniversary. At last but not least, thank you to you, our audience, for your attendance today. Please be assured that you are not only enjoying a magnificent concert, but you have contributed to improving the lives of children and young people impacted by Huntington's disease. Thank you. But always a medically related uh, cause and the charities have been a real pleasure to work with because we like small charities because they usually have very motivated individuals who really, oh there was a wonderful neuroscience one for research in brain tumours in children uh, that was Brainwave in Melbourne. People who have been, I mean we have criteria for joining, uh, one is to have at least six grade AMEB as a minimum level of technical ability, most people are higher than that which is great, um, and actively playing, but if I know that someone wants to restart playing 
and this gives them the opportunity to get back into playing. That's one of the nicest things we can do for colleagues because I just remember parts of my life when I wasn't playing and when I was training and working too hard, they were very tough years of my life. And whenever I have time to play and be engaged in music making, my life's always more balanced and happy. So to bring people back into the fold to play, and it's done that for a lot of people, which is uh, a really nice uh, thing. I mean, to give you a quote uh, from the European Doctors' Orchestra, which was set up in 94, there's a lovely man, um, 2004, sorry, lovely man called Michael Lasserson, who was a GP. And when I went to London, I had this idea of setting up a European one. And uh, they said, uh, I said, who should I see? I said, go and talk to Michael Lasserson. So he's this lovely man. And I went out and I met him. And uh, he, then he really ran it with me, but he did the lion's share of the work for eight years. And when he died, I got a lovely letter. I'd already moved back to Australia. I got a lovely letter from his son, uh, who was a professional violist and his other son's professional cellist. Uh, he said, we want to thank you from the bottom of our hearts for giving dad the golden years of his retirement because his whole time was spent on uh, running and doing the orchestra. So it gives people a lot of pleasure to be involved. We love music. We love being inside a huge body of sound. Uh, you asked me uh, previously about uh, how big the Hobart concert was in 2000, only because we're going there again next year in 2019. Um, and we had 104 in the orchestra and a 25-piece brass band from the Anglesey Barracks and we did uh, Tchaikovsky's 1812 Overture. I mean, to be inside that sound, uh, not mentioning the cannons, <laughs> uh, is fantastic, you know, to be inside a big body of sound. And that Shostakovich we did in Sydney last year for the 25th anniversary, that, that would not have been possible to play that piece uh, back then. The standard has gone up and up and up as more younger people join the orchestra and we're just more comfortable with it as well. So it's a, it's a real pleasure for a lot of people. I've been involved with the ADA for the last 10 years, play, uh, play every year and it's always a great highlight of the year to be able to involve with one's colleagues playing great music. It's a bit fairly stressful because it's a fairly stressful weekend, but we always have a fun concert and it's uh, wonderful to have colleagues from all over Australia coming together to play to their passion, to enjoy their passion of making music. I always enjoy playing the trombone, I always enjoy uh, uh, being involved with any musical event and so it's something that it gets you out of, the, out of your routine work and it's something to look forward to, um, but it's also sort of innate in many doctors to make make music, music and medicine go together pretty closely and uh, I suppose it's something to, as an interest outside one's normal work and it's so important to have those. I've been part of ADO, Australian Doctors Orchestra, since it started in 1993 in Melbourne and have played every year bar one of those 25 years. So this concert's particularly special because it's celebrating our 25th anniversary. So for quarter of a century, uh, at least a hundred doctors are getting together each year and now twice a year to play music together. It's a last minute rehearsal over a couple of days before the concert, after rehearsing on our own at home and raising money for charity. So it's a great atmosphere. We work hard, but we have so much fun and it's really satisfying to know that we're raising money for good medical charities. My name is Louis Sharp and I'm the assistant conductor of the ADO for 2017. Uh, having the program of what we have, Shostakovich 10th Symphony, which was premiered in 1953, as a kind of talk back to the Stalin years, um, having the Australian Doctors' Orchestra prepare such a difficult and passionate and fire and enthusiastic work, not showing that they well, they always bring their passion and their fire from their day jobs into music, which they also have a real strong passion about. And that's something that makes an event like this extremely unique. Having the chance to come together with doctors from all over Australia in a single room for a very short amount of time to be able to prepare real serious symphonic repertoire is a celebration of their passion and their fire and drive towards excellence, whether it's 
in their day job or the artistic dream that they have possibly as a musician as well? Yeah, I first heard about ADO when I was an, an intern, um, so very junior doctor, and it was like a saving grace for me. Um, I found out about it through a colleague. and. Um, so what it is, it's a, a large group of doctors all over Australia who are part of this membership base. And each year we do two concerts and in that, uh, in that year, um, or in a particular concert, there will be some sort of 60 or 100 players out of that group who um, often travel uh, interstate to, to join the group and to play for a few days. So usually about three days leading up to a concert, culminating in a concert on day three. Um, it's a great group of people. I've made a lot of friends through the group and um, certainly we always play for a very good cause. So uh, today, well, this weekend, we're playing for Huntington's New South Wales, which is a, a fantastic charity that does a lot of work um, for patients and families um, suffering from Huntington's disease. And uh, yeah, so it, it's just, a, to be honest, it's just a lot of fun for us um, as doctors because we get to uh, bring out our instruments and play together, which is very social and worked really, really hard towards a common goal. It's good fun. arrived in England in 2002 and it wasn't a difficult thing to set up because I had the model of how to do the Australian one because there's all sorts of legal and ABN numbers and legal requirements to set up something like that um, and so I used the Australian model to set the European one up. The only thing with, with the European one, if you use European in your name um, it has to go through European Parliament. You can't just use European as a name. Um, and I mean, it's only just paperwork, but it still has to be approved. Um, and uh, and uh, I'm told that someone else, I think the Germans wanted to set up a similar thing uh, and we'd beat them by three months. Well, of course, that gave my English colleagues particular pleasure. <laughs> but that's a lot of fun because we go, we play one in the UK and then uh, the other concert is in the, uh, on the continent. So the first one we played in London uh, at um, Blackheath Halls near the Docklands. Um, and um, the next one was in Romania in Bucharest. And since then we've been to um, Hungary twice, to Budapest. We've been to Berlin several times. Uh, we've been to Italy in Verona, which was absolutely stunning. Uh, Holland, Rotterdam last year, middle of the year, and Belfast. We'd played Marla II in Belfast with a medical choir, which was amazing. That actually formed the choir specially for that concert. And I don't know if you know it, but it's, it's the most amazing. Marla II, The Resurrection, it's called, is the most amazing piece of music. It, it goes for 85 minutes, um, and there's nothing else on the program, of course. It's one uh, piece uh, concert. And, uh, and, it, and it worked beautifully. And um, they, they got all these singing doctors from all over Ireland. In fact, the, cor the choral master said that uh, this weekend no, there'd be no proper choirs in any of the parishes in the, in the whole of Ireland because they're all here in Belfast singing this concert. And the really nice thing is they've stayed together as a group uh, and they've stayed the Irish Medical Choir, I think they're called. And uh, that's nice. It's nice for them and 
Um, it's just a nice activity for everyone. Age six, my mother thought it'd be a good idea for me to learn the violin, uh, which I learned from a member of the, uh, of the Budapest Opera, uh, violinist. And then I continued that and I played the violin all through the years, but I've always had a wonderful uh, love of the viola sound, which is deeper, of course. Uh, and, but the difficulty is it's a different clef, so it's, it, you have to learn the clef. And I put it off, put it off, and about 10 years ago I bit the bullet and I said, I've just got to commit myself, I'm going to play viola. And uh, so I play both still, uh, but I do love the viola, so I'm uh, really more a violist. The interesting thing is if I pick the violin up, it's so automatic, it's, it, there is no cerebral anything, it's just there. With viola I still have to think sometimes if it's sharper and flat and what the note, you know. It's not as automatic. Still, I'm only 70, so I've got plenty of years to go. <laughs>